Welcome to High Tech Heroes, the program that takes you behind the scenes of today's high tech industries, where you can meet the people and examine the ideas creating tomorrow's technology. And now, coming to you from the studios of Foothill College, high atop the mountains overlooking Silicon Valley, here's your host, Sherwin Gooch. Hello, I'm Sherwin Gooch. Welcome to High Tech Heroes. Our guest this week was born in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, and grew up in Wood Woodfield, Maryland. He's an accomplished musician and always wanted to be a mathematician. His first machine was a calculator rather than a computer. When he was eight years old and just tall enough to reach the calculators and store displays, he began programming the HP 45. All through high school, our guest worked part-time for the National Bureau of Standards. At the NBS, he had access to lots of little S100 machines and fell in love with the idea of personal computers. In St. Louis, at Washington University, our guest studied X-ray crystallography, molecular genetics, biology, and computing. He served as director of the Personal Computing Support Center and maintained the department's extensive computing facilities. He also developed X-ray detecting systems and a computer-controlled multi-reflection diffractometer. Moving into communications, our guest then built a number of networks and ended up, and ended up maintaining the entire university-wide computer network, as well as providing final approval for all departmental computer acquisitions. In his spare time, he served as chief engineer of radio station KWUR. Out of school, he took a position with Lucasfilm, where he wrote real-time and DSP code, taught a course on integrating music and graphics, designed a computer music studio, and architected Lucasfilm's entire workstation family. Moving to Industrial Light and Magic, he helped establish the Digital Effects Group, built a high-resolution, high-speed film scanner, wrote image processing code for RISC machines, designed and built a robotic camera motion control system utilizing the Macintosh AROS multiprocessing OS, and served as consultant to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. At the present time, our guest is writing a book on data compression and serving as president of Bay Area SIGGRAPH. At established startup SuperMac Technology, he holds the position of principal rocket scientist. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to our program a futurist, graphics expert, systems architect, and self-described degenerate mathematician, Mr. Bruce McDiffitt. Hello, Bruce, and welcome to High Tech Heroes. Nice seeing you again, Sherwin. Yeah, great. So, uh, what exactly is a degenerate mathematician? Well, I suppose a degenerate mathematician is someone who originally wanted to be a mathematician and then kind of slid downhill into physics and semiconductor physics and wasn't entirely perfect at that and kind of went further down the curve into chemistry mm -hmm. and then electrical engineering and finally fell down to the, the bottom of the well and ended up doing software, you know, down here where the rest of the Phoebes end up. And you don't really cut it up here at the mathematician level. You don't see uh, physics as above mathematics? No, I don't, because well. I mean, we, we've had this discussion before, <laughs> and we'll probably have it again after probably the show. Probably so, okay. Uh, but no, I think um, mathematicians are kind of at the top of the food chain. Okay. But, uh, well, before we begin discussing your vision of the future, I wonder if you could tell just a little bit, or, or maybe just mention the movies that you worked on at, when you were at well, uh, Lucasfilm I mean, and ILM. The, the, the Lucasfilm boundaries were kind of between uh, Roger Rabbit uh, on, and on the front end, and Terminator 2 on the back end, although I really didn't start at ILM. Until How about Howard the Duck? Now, Howard was a little bit before that, although I always wear my Howard shirt whenever I'm going to see George, just to kind of, you know. Well, see, I like ultralights, which, anyway. I indeed. So, eat claw, Howard. So, anyway, so you say uh, Star Wars, did you say? Uh, no, Star Wars was, a, I was a little bit young for Star Wars. Mm -hmm. It would have been kind of cool to, when was that, 75? Seven, no, 77. That's when Star Wars was, so I was that a is, little bit young and on the wrong ago. coast. Mm -hmm. So yeah, actually that's coming up on the 20th anniversary soon, which will be the gate for when so, the second series of Star Wars comes out. But you've probably seen every kind of uh, special effect there is. I mean, yeah, actually I think I probably have seen every kind of special effect there is. And after a while, you get to the point where you say, okay, well, we can blow up this thing, or we can model that thing, mm -hmm, or we can make mm -hmm. this thing walk. Um, not to imply that uh, that I did everything that Industrial Light Magic did. I mean, ILM is is a closely knit group of you know, hundreds of people who all work extremely hard mm -hmm. and are all wonderfully talented individuals. And I would never want to claim credit for doing everything. It's very much a yeah, team well, effort. I thought maybe that tied in, though, with uh, 
with we do uh, what we credit to call content television or content ba based television here and I noticed you didn't want to especially bring a lot of special effects along. That's exactly with you. right. One of the things that I thought about and one the, I came to the realization while I was working there thinking about communications technologies and media technologies in general that things like big movies and special effects and things exploding were in fact relatively content free mm -hmm. and not only that, there were a very limited class of people who could actually afford to, to use those kind of techniques. There aren't that many folks who can afford to build, uh, let's say, a, a quarter of a million dollar train and drive it off the end of a cliff, Boy, or we, build a $300,000 blimp and, and blow it up. We could make a lot of shows for a quarter of a million dollars. Although we could try to crash one of the cameras later if you want to feel like you're, I mean, on your way up the movie making we'll scale. We'll have to ask Craig about that. I'm, I'm sure he's not uh, really happy about that. I suppose the first thing we should do is like get a limo with some booze in the back and do too much coke and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so why did you abandon your career in show business? Um, because what I, I decided that what I wanted to do was not just enable people who are very wealthy. You say that it's show business and I think that's a very important point. It is the entertainment business. Right. It is not the, the important product is not entertainment. The important product is whatever it, you can sell to make a lot of money. Turns out that that's movies and magazines and videotapes and things like that. They work pretty well. But the essence, what drives the entire pipeline, is not, hey, here's this great idea. Hey, here's this wonderfully group of talented people. It is, how much money can we make for this? For example, a, a movie script is it's typically a, a wonderful piece of somebody's life. But in general, you look at a movie script as a stock, a stock offering. It's a prospectus. It is invest you know, $50 million in this and get a return of $200 million. Do the writers look at it that way, too? Um, the writers, to an extent, have to. I guess but they, even whether they like it or not, that's the way the business works. The ones who stay in it, I guess, for a while do. Cause yeah, the ones who actually make some money and make a living at it have to realize that it is a business first. And it is, it's artistic expression sec second. And after a while, that started to get to me. I decided that what I wanted to do was, was build things and create things that uh, enabled people, like myself, because mm -hmm. I don't have $50 million to spend on a movie. George does, Stephen does, Jim Cameron does, but I don't. I don't think you do, unless no, you've been I, I wish well. I did. But, uh, so didn't. it was important to me to be able to en enable everyone rather than just uh, a few people who are already pretty well off. And so that's what I decided that I wanted to do next. So um, now a lot, of, a lot of technical people just like to play with technical toys. And you're sort of saying that uh, you'd like to be involved with some sort of social uh, change or something, it sounds like. I think that's exactly right. And I spent a long time playing Hermit on top of Mount Tam this summer, trying mm -hmm. to decide exactly how to make that happen. And ra rather than just be involved with the next stage of techno toy, because I'd seen it in a lot of different places, and it was very exciting yeah. while I was doing it, but after a while it began to feel kind of yeah. empty or, or without, without direction. Bigger, faster, better. Yeah, mm -hmm. can do it over and over and over again. And, and continue to, concepts, I continue to keep yeah. my hand in that. It's not like that's not fun. But it was important to use it for the right reason, right, as opposed right. to just uh, build the things uh, as an end in themselves. So now, why would you uh, think that other technical people should worry about social change? I mean, well, I think the issue here is whether you want to have a world that's uh, a world that you want to live in. And can you sit, sit here and say right now that you're happy with the state of the world, that you're happy with you know, wars in the Middle East and, and people here <laughs> in the United States not being uh, well fed? And uh, No, I mean, I, I can't say that. Uh, I, I've seen some statistics about the distribution of wealth lately that, that are, I mean, uh, Ravi Batra, I guess, quoted uh, in 1989 that the distribution of wealth was something like the, the richest 1% of the people in the U.S. own 30 36 percent of, yeah, the, of the there. wealth and that was more than 1928 which triggered I mean his theory anyway triggered the depression it was uh, only 33 percent mm -hmm. and that's uh, in the past 10 years or so it's gotten even a little more skewed there are a lot more poor people there are mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. people who are wealthy control yeah. even more and you have to look beyond that to say that beyond that 40 percent that people directly own there are many parts of the problem, many, many things that they don't directly own, but that they can influence. Mm -hmm. You, for example, um, somebody who's very wealthy can, can suggest that you do something or they'll fire you. They don't, have oh. to, they don't have to own your home to be able to influence no, your behavior we're, that way. we're on access. We can't be canceled. Oh, okay. <laughs> but somebody can use the clicker. <laughs> yeah, well, they do all the time, I'm sure. I mean, yeah. we just are here for the techies. Uh, yo, dude, well, what shows the game on? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So, um, so how, how do you think that can be changed? What, well, what technology do you think is best to change? The things that I think are most important are what can be considered communications technologies. Mm -hmm. And you can look at that bi-directionally. Um, split communications into two things, education mm -hmm. and expression. So the education being 
looking around at the world. Education is sort of information into the brain and that's exactly right. It's, it's neural it's information out. In and out. That's, that's exactly right. right. Well, we have to take a break right now. We can talk a little bit more about that uh, afterwards. So, Bruce will be right back to tell us what we can do to improve our future. Uh, see you in one and three in the future. Remember, duck, cover, and hold. First, let me personally thank every one of you who donated blood to the Red Cross while we were over in the Gulf. You saved a lot of lives, but now we need you again in our civilian lives. Because the Red Cross is now experiencing a shortage in our area, giving blood now is just as important as it was then. Maybe more so. Blood is needed now, more than ever. Contact your local Red Cross today. Welcome to the future. We're glad you made it. Today on High Tech Heroes, we're talking with Bruce McDiffitt about the technologies he thinks will most improve our collective future. And I guess right before we went to break, you said uh, you think that and uh, communications technology is probably the most important thing. Yeah, I really do. I think it, it provides, it's, it's the key it is uh, that, that will allow us, you and I and everybody else here, to actively change our world. It what is what will give us enough power to be able to do that. Yeah, you know, I think it already has. I really, I really believe that uh, the VCR is what caused the downfall of, you know, Russia, of, of, U, of the USSR. Because, you know, all those people who were so high in the Politburo were the ones who could afford VCRs first, and then there was a whole underground network of, you know, Clint Eastwood uh, fans and stuff. And, and although that's not real USA, you know, I mean, the Hollywood image is so much closer than what, I mean, than nothing at all. It gave them some ideas, I think. Yeah, I agree. That, that may have had some part to play. Um, that, that brings up, I wanted to bring along a piece of technology that I think is maybe one of the most revolutionary, if not radical and powerful pieces of you know, technology that uh, I've seen. Uh -huh. And I think probably it's not going to surprise anybody. What it is is one of these guys. This is, um, if you want to take a look, this is all that it is. It's a Handycam, an 8-millimeter eight, eight portable VCR. Very nice. The great thing about this, not to, you know, in fact, I'll put in, it on the side where you can't see the brand name. In fact, in episodes 35 and 36, we use, I think, the same model. Is that wow. the same as yours, Ducky? Yeah. The important thing about it, think about this. This, th th this is, is making news today. Look at the, as we tape, the Rodney King trial is going on in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. People are actively changing the structure of the police department, the, their relationship with the, their social power structure, because of stuff like this. If, Rod, if, if that tape hadn't been made, and I'm sure everyone has seen that tape, and there's no reason to go to a violent you know, episode here to, to right. play it over again. Right. If that tape had not been made, Rodney King would be in jail for resisting arrest, and right. that would be the end of the right. story. Mm -hmm. But because somebody had one of these, things are are wildly different. That's one person with one, little, with one little piece of communications technology. Same thing's true if you look at what was going on in China, in Tiananmen Square. Uh, great videos coming mm -hmm. out of there as well. For a while. For, yeah, <clears throat> for a while. But, well. Um, yeah, well, the thing that amazed me about the Rodney King video was that uh, it didn't upset any of my black friends. The black community said, oh, that's you know, so, you know, um, that's the way things always are. And well, everybody else was uh, just up and on. One of the things it. that I would want to talk about tonight is how things, how you view the world is very much dependent on the amount of information and the kind of information where you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, your perception as, well, you know, if we're in the Bay Area right now, our perception of the world here is quite a bit different than if we lived in Central America or Southeast Asia or even in Europe. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, even your language uh, determines what you can, what you can conceive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even a, an effect called the Weberian effect in linguistics, which says that you, certain things cannot be communicated between people who speak different languages. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, but for all those of us who are speaking English right now, we'll try to take the approach that we'll change our own world first. At least that's how I want to look at it. Mm -hmm. And then if we can, we can propagate those changes outward. Uh, I've spent a lot of time thinking about wanting to change the world. It's a really lofty goal. Great, I'll make the world better. Well, yeah, it's a difficult well. thing to just do one afternoon. Hey, I'm going to fix the world today. All right. Uh, so what do you advocate? Well, what I advocate is to get back to the notion of communications technologies. We're at a point 
Let me back up and talk a little bit about okay. how information flows in our society, if, if I can draw here for a moment. Absolutely. This being a, a very much techno retro kind of okay. show today. Well, rather, you know, well, rather than drag along a whole bunch of you know, whizzy special sure. effects or whatever, if you want to see that stuff, go to the video yeah, store well, and rent it. It shows that we're not gadget freaks here. Exactly. We use the technology that gets the job. So I won't even use, well, I, I go could ahead. try to use my left hand and pretend I'm artistic, but instead I won't. Right now in our society, the way information flows is from the top down. Start at the top, and you've got some TV station right. or a newspaper or whatever. And that kind of propagates downward through levels. And we end up down here at the bottom with somebody like me sitting at home watching High Tech Heroes. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you have somebody up here at the top, some wealthy person who owns the TV station, right? who actually decides what it is that gets broadcast. Well, how does he do that? Well, um, it, it's, one doesn't have to explicitly hang out at the, at the, at the station and say, mm -hmm. broadcast this or not broadcast that. It, it, it only makes sense. I'm only asking people to use their, their intuition or knowledge about technology to see that th this kind of system is, in, in fact, going to enforce the, or, or reinforce or promote the values of the people who own TV stations and newspapers and other things like that. Clearly, folks who, print, who, who own a television station mm -hmm. aren't going to broadcast you know, scathing exposés on how the television station is, in fact, yes, <laughs> in misleading fact, people are only I was in a, in a uh, situation in, in the South once where they were, where uh, one of the state governments was getting, giving special grants to one of the Keep going. It's okay. Computer I'm, I'm, I'm companies, paying attention. One that, uh, that actually uh, is known to have given the largest overseas bribe. It's a record-setting thing. And, uh, and uh, went to the newspaper about that, and they said, well, you know, we spend most of our time deciding what we can print, mm -hmm. not what should be printed. So, That's exactly right. Okay, so this is the guy at the top. This is the guy at the top, or set of forces. It's not like uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we've discussed mm -hmm. is how there doesn't have to be direct intervention, nor does there have to be any kind of collusion between the people who own the, you know, the television station and people who run the government and people who just generally own business. There, okay. there does not have to be any kind of conspiracy in order to be able to determine what happens mm -hmm. here. The fact that these people have similar interests, I mean, a TV station or a TV network may cost you billions of dollars to obtain. Clearly, somebody like that has an interest in maintaining their investment. Same thing is true in, in business or, or in government. In uh, government. In government as well. One wants to protect one's investment or one's power base. Uh, and, and the fact that, that all these people have similar interests means they, may ha they probably have similar behaviors. Uh, mm -hmm. As an example, um, you and I may like hockey. And so we may, in fact, see each other at a San Jose Sharks game especially if we you know, right. own Dave's right. season tickets. Right. <laughs> and the fact that you and I see each other there at the game mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to depend at all upon some kind of conspiracy theory that says we, you know, we were met in some secret room to meet at the game someday. We just haven't had that mutual interest, and it affected right. our behavior in similar ways. Same thing's true here between the four, you know, people in, we'll say TV here, but we'll say media in general, and business and government. And you know, we'll have similar functionaries over here. So, so you think, um, well, l let me ask a question. Mm -hmm. Sure. So hypothetically, it might be the case that the people at the top wouldn't want people to get an education so they could understand statistics, because if they did, they would understand that how much percentage of the wealth 1%. Oh, has. indeed. That's absolutely and, right. And they might also understand that the income is not wealth. And the way the system works with people up here at the top actually telling you and me what to do, mm -hmm. not necessarily, like, as I said, not explicitly saying go to work today, Sherwin, but you have to go to work today, Sherwin, or you eventually don't make your rent or your mortgage or you can't buy food. So it's not as if... Or you, you end, end up in You're prison. completely free to make that choice. Or you end up in prison. There's another good one. You and I are down here on other parts of the, mm -hmm. other parts of the world. We're very separate. We don't have a, a, there's no way in this communications model where information flows downhill. Okay, so what, uh, what technology do you think is best to work on? Um, I mean, what, what's the most effective thing that people could work on? Okay, what I think the effective things for people to work on are um, we need to wait for the day when we'll assume that the telephone company or some kind of large, large company like that is going to install, we'll assume, fiber, point-to-point -point fiber. Uh, yeah, in fact, HUD mentioned that they installed the fiber cable behind his house last week. Well, that's great. So HUD's part <laughs> of the way there. Yeah. It's not there for me yet, but yeah. when, we're th when we're that to that point, uh, we'll actually have broadband connection from person to person to person. What I want to well, say is not about person to person. From, well, from, from person per to switch to PBX, right? Well, at, at that point. But mm -hmm. if the PBX technology can, in fact, um, either a packet switch or broadcast. Okay, so to borrow your diagram, I mean, this mm -hmm. guy here, he's mm -hmm. got fiber, it goes into some office, and then it comes back. Something like that. Or it goes up a you know, tree structure like this to but eventually get back to the You don't the care where, as, as long as they're virtual circuit connected exactly. peer to peer. The, the model that you want to implement is not top down. Where, I mean, this is, this is, this is a, a bottleneck. Everybody in engineering knows what a bottleneck is. And, what happens, and it gets, information gets filtered here. You don't mm -hmm. hear stuff at, at this point 
I mean, you, you, yeah, you don't hear stuff that's very contrary to the interests up, up at the top coming through this pipe. The only way you get stuff like that is down here at the bottom. So in fact, the model that you want is not everyone separated this way, because these people down here are also very separated. You and I, even though we live on the same block, we watch the same TV stations, we read the same paper, mm -hmm. we have very little notion of, of what it is that we have in common, the, the interests that we have. Instead, what we really want to have in, in terms of the communications network is some kind of, this is a very poor polygon. I'll draw a polygon here. Stop. Stop. OK, all right, you okay. get the idea. Mm -hmm. The point is that you want all the diagonals of the polygon connected. You as, you as a person want to be able to talk to everyone else. And the same thing's true for everyone else in, in, your, in right. your octagon of friends. And the telephone system works this way. The telephone system works this way to an extent. However, it's, it's relatively low bandwidth. And mm -hmm. the problem is it's very much human limited. You can use the telephone to say, hi, I think this ought to be changed. Or what do you want to do with your life? What's important to you today? Well, now, the telephone, actually, if we talk about bandwidths, Shannon says that uh, human speech contains 10 bits per second of non-redundant information. Um, so that's yeah, pretty low and, bandwidth. And possibly even less than when you listen to what we're saying tonight. Uh, um, uh, 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 yeah. Hey, Sherwin. Uh, how about those Niners? Huh? Um, so anyway, back to this model here. If we can come up with a system like this, a uh -huh. communication system, mm -hmm. what it means is that if I'm sitting over here, I can get input from anyone and at the same time, I can express my views to anyone else in the world. This kind of model, which is very soon, uh, to, uh, will be arriving very soon. We're seeing parts of it in, in, in separate places in the, in the country and, and, and the world. Well, I hope so, you know. But now HUD and I and a lot of other people around have tried, we call it tilting at the, uh, at the big system windmill, have tried yeah. to build these big time sharing systems or even just big database sharing systems. And, you know, something there is in nature that abhors this system. It well, can't what, be built. I mean, and not because it's a technical problem. It's not a technical problem. Indeed, it's not a technical problem. What it is, it's, it's a systemic problem. The reason the system works the way that it does is that mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's built and refined and it's been evolved so that it supports its current structure. Right. And it resists changes to that structure the same way that any other animal resists attacks. You know, when you, if you talk about things but evolving, technology evolves. It's very evolves hard too. to see the attacks, if, if there are attacks. It's very hard to, it's Indeed, just it's absolutely, somehow the it's, funding it doesn't, is, doesn't come about. It is very, about. very difficult to see. And one of the, one of the things that's, that it's hard to do, and why I wanted to step back from using gadgets tonight, mm -hmm. was that I wanted to ask people to, instead of thinking about gadgets and what's the latest techno toy that helps me change the world, is it a phaser? Oh, that'd be cool. Zap, you're dead. Um, that's, not a, that's not what you want to do. Well, I'd rather be on stun. Huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Just talk to people for a while, Sherwin. It has the same effect. <laughs> Ooh, oops. No, we'll, we'll edit that out later. Anyway. Anyway. So, so you're talking peer-to-peer -peer communication network, no matter how it's realized. Yeah. And if I can just finish that one okay. point, the, the, what I wanted to, what I'm trying to get people to do now is instead of using or thinking about strictly technology, to use their brains instead, mm -hmm. to, and try to look around and say, well, why are things the way that they are? Step back, rather than you know, take your nose away from the grindstone for a moment, and, and think. And, and, and try to really analyze something the way that you know, a high-tech hero would, as opposed to a high-tech wonk who goes to work and does the same old thing every day and comes up with a new widget every couple of years, which is really cool, but doesn't really change the overall rat race of going to work every day to build a new widget every three years to try to you know, make your stock go up and sell mm -hmm. a car so right. the guy who owns the company right. can buy a uh, Ferrari. OK. It's OK. They'll run, they'll run it in I'm, slow motion and, 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 and play it back yeah, over right. and over I'm again. I'm kind of lost here. But hours and hours of family entertainment. So what do you think is like the most important technology to work on? This, okay. this communications technology? This kind of stuff. I mean, are we talking ISDN here? Indeed, ISDN will help us. Uh, what I wanted, uh, the reason I wanted to use a model like this is I want to tell people where we should go. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of systems that I think we should build, because what they do is they give us leverage. Uh, here, we don't really have any leverage. Here, we have the ability to mobilize forces, to at least to, to have some kind of dis open discussion and and come to some consensus as to how we'd want to make things different. One of the reasons that things never change from this is that it's very difficult for people to get together and decide how they would want to change anything. You've got a couple of people, maybe you and me, maybe HUD and maybe Dave, hang out and we say, oh, we want to do this. But compared to the 4 billion people in the world, um, we don't really do very much. We a system like this, we can actually get together and filter stuff. Well, I hope so. But you know, we have had another problem, too. Uh, a lot of us who built big systems were associated with universities. And we found that there were great discussions that mm -hmm. went on there and a lot of education. But then. Um, when we got out in the real world, I compare it uh, to ham radio versus citizens band. Mm -hmm. Not that not that the information is any is any w well is any lower, but it's not of as high a quality. Mm -hmm. And uh, and in fact, HUD and I, for example, got so com you know so uh, so frustrated with the whole thing that we decided, well, 
if we're the only people who want to source information, then, then we'll use the existing network, mm -hmm. the television distribution system, and that's part of what we're doing here. The, pro the only problem with that, and I, and I, and I applaud you, I, I laud you for that, um, because it's an, an important thing. Access cable is a, a step in the right direction. The problem is only very few people have access to a facility like this one. I mean, it costs a lot of money. You have, to, you have to know people. You have to make a certain commitment. If someone isn't in the right area, they're not in the Bay Area, they're just at home, but they have something important to say, they can't just go out and roll their own cable TV show. So this is indeed motion in the right direction, but we want to extend it so that you don't have to, you don't have to leap as high to do your own TV. You can do your own TV at home, broadcast a cable instead of being on cable here in the Valley, just be able to plug it right into your wall and send it out. Now, of course, you're going to need intelligent agents to be able to help you in this endeavor. Right. So we've got about half a minute left. How can you sum up here? Wait a second. You misled me completely. I thought we were going to work through this. All right. Let's, let's lead things together. One of, one of the things I want to point out mm -hmm. are, um, here's a really cool book. Uh, this book is titled Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media. It's by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. This is... I, 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 Heavens to Betsy, we're actually going to read something here in Silicon Valley. Um, We've got to go. We've got to go. Yeah! <laughs> win. Well, thanks for watching High Tech Heroes. Be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week when we have a surprise for you. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> I don't understand. I mean, here we, I mean. Thank you for joining us this week for High Tech Heroes. Be sure to watch High Tech Heroes again next week when we will bring you more entertaining information about the people and ideas behind the scenes in high tech industry. And now, this is your announcer, Margie Foote, wishing you the best of luck and a pleasant week. Au revoir. This episode of High Tech Heroes has been made possible in part by grants from Linksys Corporation of Lafayette, Indiana, Kinetic Microscience of San Jose, California, Behind the Scenes Software Incorporated of West Lafayette, Indiana, and Cybernetic Arts of Sunnyvale, California.